Hi, I'm Sanjay Mujumna, one of the plastic surgery consultants at Pinderfields, and I wanted to discuss Dupuytren's disease with you. Dupuytren's disease is actually reasonably common in the United Kingdom, uh, whilst it's not very common at all in other parts of the world. And uh, it's more common in the northeast of England and Scotland. We'll come back to that in a second. Now, what is Dupuytren's disease? Well, patients, when they present with Dupuytren's disease, come with lumps predominantly in the palms of the hand and these lumps can then go on to their fingers and as things advance the lumps which have gone on the fingers and now look like ropes can start to contract and when they contract people can have fingers that are bent in that they can't straighten anymore and they come and say well doc I can't uh, have trouble washing my face because my fingers I stick my um, finger into my eye I can't put my hand into my pocket and these are the sort of functional uh, problems they get. On occasion, just with lumps in the palms of the hand, people can complain of pain and that's because the lumps can press onto the nerves in the hand. But predominantly, pain is not an issue. It's mainly to do with not being able to straighten the fingers. One can get Dupuytrens also in the soles of the feet because, let's face it, the soles of the feet anatomically are very much like the palms of our hands and we can, one can also very rarely uh, get Dupuytren affecting the penile shaft and that's because um, the tissue around the penile shaft is not dissimilar to the tissue that's affected in the palm and the soles of the feet. Now what is this tissue? Well to understand the tissue that is actually um, affected and uh, by Dupuytren, let's go back to the anatomy of the hand. If one looks at the palm of the hand versus the back of the hand, the skin differs in a few ways. One, the skin on the back of the hand is thinner than on the palm of the hand and you'd expect that because we're handling things and you want to have hardier skin on the palm of the hand. Also, the skin on the back of the hand is hairier while the skin on the back the palm of the hand is without hair and that's called glabrous skin. That's quite important because if you have hair on the palm of your hand and it produces the oily substance, it becomes slippery, so when you try to grab things, it falls out. We know that so because when people lose the skin on the palm of their hand and it brings skin from elsewhere, they have problems grasping things because it becomes slippery. The third way that it differs is that the skin on the back of the hand is quite slidey, while the skin on the palm of the hand is not as slidey. In actual fact, it's not the skin that's slidey, but the skin is actually sitting on the muscle. And the surface of the muscle has got a very slidey layer and the skin slides on that. Now similarly, on the palm of the hand, if the skin was sitting straight on the muscle, it would slide around as well. To prevent that happening, God in her infinite wisdom decided to put a layer of tissue between the skin and the muscle. And this tissue is called the fascia. The fascia you can imagine to be much like a carpet underlay or something you put under a mat so that when you step on it, it doesn't slide if you put it on a slippery surface. And this fascia it sits on the muscle, but it's also attached to the overlying skin. And that's why we get these lines on the palms and on the fingers where the fascia is attached to the skin, tethering it down so it doesn't slide around. So the lines on the hand, unfortunately, have nothing to do with how long you're going to live, how much money you're going to make. It's just anatomy, really. It's important to understand that this fascia is a three-dimensional structure, it's not only flat. When you look at it from the top, it looks like a triangle going on to, and then going on to the fingers, but it's got three-dimensional extension. And that's important when we're doing surgery, and we'll elaborate on that in a little while. Now, so you understood that this fascia exists, and in normal life, it's fine. But when people get Dupuytrens, we get a spontaneous onset. So not related to any surgery, or any cancers, or anything that we know about, we suddenly get these lumps appearing and these lumps are actually scar tissue and these scar tissues then progress on and as you get more they go onto the fingers and they coalesce to become from lumps to become what you call cords which are like little ropes and all scar tissue will contract that's what scar tissue does and as this bit of rope goes across into your fingers 
and the scar tissue contracts where your joints get bent in and you can't straighten it because the scar is preventing it. And that's what essentially Dupitrons is. On the soles of the feet, it doesn't go on into the toes and cause curling as much, it causes discomfort. Similarly, on the palms of our hands, sometimes the lumps can cause a bit of pain and that's because the scar tissue, which is kind of firm and hard, presses on nerves when you grasp anything. The scar itself is not painful, it is the scar pressing on the nerves that may cause pain. But predominantly, the problem is a functional problem. Doc, I can't put my hand into my pocket. Doc, I, when I wash my face, I tend to poke my eye with my finger because it's bent. These are the main issues. So that's what Dupitron's disease is. So how do you treat it? Well, if they have no pain, they just get a few lumps and there's no bending of the finger, you can leave it alone. That's absolutely fine. Some people use something called a tabletop test where if you can put your hand flat on the table, well, then you don't need an operation. That's fairly um, blunderbuss if you, if you ask me. Essentially, if somebody's got Dupitron's tissue and Dupitron's disease and they're able to do all the things that they want to do at work and play and recreational, they don't need an operation. If, however, they're getting a bending of the finger and is causing any problems with their lifestyle, then you've got to think about whether you need to be able to correct that functionally for them. And how do you correct it? Well, the predominant way of correcting it is making some cuts on the hand and the fingers, lifting the skin, taking the disease Dupuytren's tissue out, and stitching it back up. And that's called a fasciectomy, meaning you're ectomizing or removing the fascia. In some instances, especially in people who are not able to have an operation, which might take a bit longer, you can do a fasciotomy, which is just essentially cutting a bit of the um, fascia, the diseased fascia, and straightening the finger up. It's a bit like cutting a rope and allowing the finger to straighten. And that's called a fasciotomy. If the overlying skin is actually involved, or the disease has come back after an operation, you may want to take some of the overlying skin with it. So you do a dermatofasciectomy, dermato is skin, fasciectomy, taking the fascia out, in which case you might need to put new skin on and you then take a full thickness skin graft from the forearm, usual location to put it on. Now, sometimes when you're doing a fasciotomy, you don't need to actually have a knife. You can take a needle, stretch the finger out, have that bit of Dupuytren's tissue at under tension like a guitar string, and then with a needle, you uh, move it up and down on the scar and until it snaps. And that's usually done for people who are probably not fit enough to have an anesthetic uh, as the Dupuytren's operation takes a bit of time. The reason it takes time is because the three-dimensional aspect of the scar. So Dupuytren's tissue is not only going on the finger, in a two-dimensional way, but it's going three-dimensionally. And some of these bits of tissue wrap around nerves and blood vessels. And because of that, we have to be very careful when we're doing the operation. When we're doing the operation, we wear loops, which is magnifying glasses. We cut off the blood supply to the hand with a tourniquet for a few minutes. And that allows us to see and protect the nerves and vessels. Okay, now, of recent times, the last few years, we've now got an injection, which is called a collagenase, which you can inject into the Dupuytren's tissue, which is made of scar tissue, which is collagen, which then chemically destroys the collagen and allows you to straighten the finger after two or three days. This sounds like a fantastic idea. The only problem is sometimes the collagen, if it doesn't sit around the Dupuytren's tissue, can get into other tissues made of collagen, like tendons, and there have been reports of some tendons rupturing on the way. So, you now know what Dupuytren's is, we know what the anatomy is and what's the treatment. Now, who gets it? Most people who get it, well, there's no particular predilection except north of England and Scotland, we said. That's because of Viking blood. It's more common in Scandinavians and as such, we know that the Scandinavians gave birth to the Vikings and the Vikings came across and after they had done the plunder and pillaging, they settled down in these parts of the United Kingdom and the bloodlines flew. Other people who get it, they are people with um, diabetes. My mum had it and believe you me, she wasn't a Viking, not as far as I know any. Uh, some people who are alcoholics, the uh, alcoholic liver disease get it. Epileptics can also get it, that's probably from the anti-epileptic drugs. So that is what we know about Dupuytren's in a nutshell. Thank you.